how do we think about our audience? How do we tell stories to reach diverse voices and represent diverse communities, underserved communities? What are the new ideas and the technologies? How do we give hope? How do we convey innovation? What are the parts of a story that we need to know and do to captivate people's attention? I have my little bumper sticker. Some of you have heard me say this before, but a lot haven't. So my bumper sticker about a story is compelling characters overcoming obstacles to achieve a worthy outcome. Just about any story you can think of, from the Bible to Superman, is about compelling characters. So you, as a storyteller, create or highlight or build that compelling character. What makes somebody fascinating, interesting, quirky, weird? Overcoming obstacles. Everybody confronts challenges and obstacles. You're a scientist. You're an athlete. You're an activist. You're a business leader. You're a political leader. To achieve your outcome, which we hope will be worthy. Right? So that's what a story does. A story tracks that trajectory. We call it a story arc, right? Some of my students know this. I've been broken records with some of them. And that's what you convey. And you can do that through a photograph. You certainly can do that with words and sounds. Right? You can do that in a podcast. What was the toughest thing you confronted? How many of you were over f across the street for the conversation with Artelia Gilliard? Right? Her own personal story makes her compelling. She's just so interesting. If we hadn't heard that about her, she would have been interesting from Ford. But part of storytelling is connecting that part of that person, right? That's special, brave, resilient with, the, with your audience so they can fall in love with them or not, because there are villains who, who can be <laughs> compelling characters too. But anyway, storytelling is great. Now one place we can really do that is in film, right? Documentary, movies. You have the image, the sound. A character can be created over a period of time. So what we're going to do now is we're going to hear from a filmmaker, and we're going to hear from some of our students who traveled the world with us. Then we're going to get to that great part of the day where we announce the winners of our StoryFest competition. I am honored to tell you that we are joined right now by the ambassador from Iceland. Madam Ambassador, thank you for being with us. We'll hear from her in a few minutes. And we're not only going to hear from her because we're going to her country, which is a happy coincidence, but Iceland has a particular story to tell. And one of the things that this country does, which I learned the other day, which is amazing, which we're going to talk about, is they engage young people at the highest levels. At the highest levels. But first, I want to introduce uh, uh, someone who has become a good friend. He is now a colleague, and he has the great honor of having the title of our first Ted Turner Professor of Environmental Media, John Sutter, filmmaker and human being extraordinaire. <laughs> Thank you, Frank. Hi, everyone. I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here with you today and, and thrilled to occupy this position in the name of Ted Turner, who, if, if you're not familiar, was the founder of, of CNN, um, also created Captain Planet. Uh, he's a bold, visionary guy who tried to shake things up and really did in the media landscape. And that's sort of what I want to talk to you about today is reframing the way we see stories about the environment and, and about, um, about the climate crisis. Um, th that's the area that I work in primarily. And I think, you know, for those paying attention, it's, it's been something like three or four decades of stories that we've been telling, uh, sort of trying to get ourselves out of the fossil fuel era and to get um, the planet back into something like balance, right? And from where I sit, it, it doesn't just take one type of story to deal with something that big and that global um, and local at the same time. I think it's a, an all hands on deck moment, truly. Like we have to try all the things to get, get these stories across and to get people to see the world in a new way. And one of the reasons that I've, I've shifted into the documentary film landscape is because I think there's an incredible power that the cinema lens has to literally reframe the world around us and reframe the, the, the environment um, as well. And so I, I wanna talk to you briefly about two um, projects that I, I'm working on, both are, are works in progress, feature length documentaries. 
um, and both seek in their own ways to, to reframe that we, the way that we see the world around us. The first is called Baseline. Um, it's, it's a film about three kids growing up on the front lines of the climate crisis. And the, the reframe is that instead of just following their stories in one moment, um, you know, one day, one disaster. I spent a lot of time as a, as a TV reporter going around the world telling stories about climate-related disasters. This film tries to stretch the, the time horizon on which we're telling the story of the climate crisis by following these kids from now until the year 2050. There's this idea of shifting baselines that I, I, I started reading about, and, it, and it, it thoroughly freaked me out, and it was the, the genesis of this, this film project. Um, it basically says that we're, we're pretty bad as people at, at feeling slow-moving, long-term change, and the climate crisis being like a very key uh, example of that. And my hope is that by telling these stories in a, in a long time horizon way, that we come to see the world around us and feel the passage of time in a slightly different way. The other film that I want to tell you about and I want to spend a little more time with is uh, tentatively called um, Planet A. It's a working title, so stop me in the hall later and tell me if you, if you, if you like that or not. Um, and it's about uh, seven researchers who spent um, a, about a month, a little more than a month, on the, ice, on the ice shelf at Thwaites Glacier in Western Antarctica. And Thwaites, you may have heard about in the news a little bit, is, is often referred to by the media as the Doomsday Glacier. And the reason it gets that name is because it holds back something like 10 feet of sea level rise in the very long term. So, you know, it has this, these sort of like apocalyptic scenarios built into it, and truly it is one of the greatest mysteries in climate science. You know, what is going to happen at Thwaites determines what happens with global sea level projections, you know, not just now, but the next 100, 200, 300 years. So the reframe is it's taking this, this global issue, which again, often gets talked about as, as just in apocalyptic terms, as a sort of doomsday scenario, and reframing it as a story about these seven scientists and their work trying to understand this place. They use um, uh, you know, radars and other equipment essentially to try to peer beneath this ice shelf. Um, they live in tents on the ice. And they, in, in various ways, you know, are trying to look from below and see the cracks that are forming um, almost all around them as they're, as they're doing this work. Um, and, and they do that, I, I find what they're doing to be incredibly inspiring because in the face of you know, truly like daunting scenarios um, uh, around what's happening with the climate, you know, they're steadfastly pushing forward with their, their version of doing something about it, right? Their version is showing up and doing their best to understand what's going on with their science. Our version as storytellers is to try to tell stories like that and to get people engaged um, with this issue in ways that they may not have before. So I, I'm gonna, um, I, I filmed a Q&A between me, I'm the producer of that film, and Emily Makdavian, who is the director of the film. She's in Salt Lake City, um, so couldn't be with us in person. I, I wanna go ahead and enroll that, that video of the Q&A that we filmed. <laughs> You'll see when this comes up, these are satellite images of the location. It's an extremely remote place. And you see what the scientists call these daggers of, or cracks that are forming around their research site, which is in the dot. Um, I started off by asking Emily what she thinks about the fact that this, this team of polar researchers is made up of, of six women and one man, which is unusual for, for polar science. I mean, it's obviously a reason that the team is interesting is that you have this team that it has all these women. Um, but from the perspective of telling the story, I, I'm not, as someone myself who works in an industry that's often predominantly not women, it's like, I don't want to be the token woman in the room, right? I want to be acknowledged for my expertise. And I think that most people feel that way. So for me, it's like, take this extraordinary group and say, this is science, this is normal, treat it as if it's normal. And then if people find it to be not normal or, or they feel that that's radical, great, good for them. But, you know, essentially it's a film about people doing science and I want to present an image of what science is that I hope can feel like a normal image of science. No, I love that. It's sort of presenting the world as it should be rather than like sort of pointing at it and drawing attention to it, just letting yeah. it exist. Um, yeah. 
That's cool. Can you walk us through like some of the details of what was involved in getting out to Antarctica and telling the story? Six flights. So the first three were commercial flights to get us down to Christchurch, New Zealand. And then the next three flights were all flights inside Antarctica or what the first was the ice flight to Antarctica and then two more flights inside Antarctica to get to the location. So it's, it's a really exceptionally remote and you feel it when you get dropped off there. Yeah. You told me there's this term called drop shock, right? Like where the, the planes leave you, you're on this ice shelf at the edge of Thwaites Glacier. So like truly out in the middle of nowhere and you're just alone there, right? And living in tents. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. This was, this was something I was introduced to by one of the other scientists, like the experience of an anxiety that can set in, in the realization that you're truly in the middle of nowhere, um, uh, which I'm laughing about now, but it's actually not funny if you're experiencing it, right? So this situation was, it, it was all tents that we pitched, you know, a science tent, a cook tent, sleeping tents, and a poo tent. And um, that was that was our little village. And, you know, and there's no structures. Everything that was there was stuff that we hauled in and built. Um, and we lived there on the ice shelf for four weeks. Um, in total, the Antarctic the whole journey and the time before and after and trainings and everything adds up to quite a lot more time than that. But the time literally on the ice shelf was, was a month. Just in terms of like making a film in that environment. uh, I know that like cameras hate extremely cold weather. They hate wind batteries die when they get too cold. And also you had like all this media that you had to store somewhere. Like, how did you, like, what was that? Like just the logistics of filming there? In terms of the batteries, what I did was um, actually the batteries and the camera. I sewed a little like coat (laughs) for the the camera and I had these extra large uh, external batteries. So not the normal batteries that the camera would use that were mounted on the back and the little coat wrapped the whole camera, protected it from wind. And then you'd put hand warmers inside there next to the batteries. And so the battery would be warmed by the hand warmer and that would allow it to have more like its normal um, you know, lifespan before you would have to recharge it. And so that was actually really effective. And there was one day where I couldn't use the coat because I had a different rig and the camera flipped out. So the coat was everything. Um, I mean, and I remember like helping you like pack for some of this and like a huge proportion of your baggage being hand, those tiny hand warmers that you sort of break up. It was unreal. <laughs> I, was, I did the math, you know, and I was like, how many hand warmers do I need? How many hours, 24 hours a day? I was like, I don't want this film to fail for lack of hand warmers, you know. Sort of the stage where we're at with this film right now is, you know, you're back from Antarctica. Obviously, you're in Salt Lake City. Um, you have something like 100 hours of footage that you've been watching down. We've been watching down together. That number, I'm sure, will sound really daunting to some people, like 100 hours of recorded material. Um, yeah. How do you take something like that and start to tease out, like, what is the narrative here? What is what is the story that I'm going to tell? Even if you just sat and watched it all through, that's two and a half weeks of full-time viewing, right? It's a lot of material to wrap your head around. And so I think part of it is you came in with something that you were interested in, in doing, something you wanted to tell, a story. And you have to be open to what you get while you're there. You have to be open to the people that you discover and how things unfold. So then you get to the end and what you're doing is you're looking for, okay, what did I actually get? Where are the things that go back to those original themes that I was interested in? Um, What do I have here in terms of scenes, right? Like a scene being something in which something changes over the course of the scene. You know, it doesn't have to be a world ending moment, but something shifts. And that's how we build long form stories is through, you know, character, through scenes in which things shift and through some kind of like motivating idea that hopefully we went in with and came out with too. Um, And so it's really a process of identifying those. And and often there are some that stand out, you know, more clearly at the beginning. And then for me also finding the subtleties that give you the rich texture of life there, that give you a more nuanced understanding of the human beings who are at work um, and to fill all of that in and, and make it feel like a whole world. Like, how do you go about showing and explaining like the actual science that's happening, the reason for their being there? It, it can be kind of like a wonky thing, like watching science unfold. So like, how do you approach that? 
Yeah. I mean, I, I think part of it is that maybe I'm just a little wonky. I love labor. You know, I love seeing people at work. Um, and I like it's it's I think patently apparent that this is a very important place to to science, to like our understanding of of, of what's going on in Antarctica. All that's clear, but I'm not interested in just like what the data yields at the end. I'm I'm interested in the the human labor and so Christian, who's one of the the one guy on the team, you know, I was filming him like obsessively, you know, getting the right little screw to fit together the pieces of one of the main science projects. And he was like, I love that you're so interested in all the fiddly details. And I'm like, <laughs> well, you know, it's the fiddly details are what are what the actual nuts and bolts of a lot of the work is. A lot of the work is digging holes and hauling things around and just like me obsessively making your kit work. Um, and I think getting into that it, it helps us get closer to the to the real experience of doing this work. Um, and and I care about that because I care about the human stories and the kind of human questions that are in, intertwined in doing this science. Um, and of course, if you approach it that way, it also opens up the possibility of seeing the ways that science is collaborative. That science is not just a kind of hero with data at the end, but uh, a group of people supporting each other and making decisions together about you know, every element of running this little tiny place and trying to get as much research done in a limited amount of time as is possible. Mm. Collaboration is also at the heart of how we and broader social structures try to address climate change. So I wanted that to be a little microcosm, um, you know, not kind of uh, forward a superhero saving the world narrative, but forward a, you know, a bunch of women collaborating together um, really intelligently to to try to do the best work possible in the circumstances. And for me, that's, that's what all of us have. So uh, thank you again to, to Emily Mokdavian for doing that, um, that Q&A. And I understand that this is like a, its own special circumstance, right? Filming a, something in Antarctica, like knowing to tape hand warmers to the batteries of your camera may not be applicable in, in all situations. Um, but I thought it was interesting. And moreover, I think it's, it's about this idea, again, of shifting the frame and choosing to look at the world around us through a fresh lens and trying to see not just what is and the, the crises that we face, but what is possible and what we can make together if we all you know, work together and decide to collaborate. So I, I really love the, that spirit and I love feeling that in this, this room with a bunch of storytellers who are all using the tools we have in front of us to try to make the world just a little bit better. Thank you.